The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on August 2nd, 2021. 3.45 p.m. I'm listening to a set of podcast episodes about the Victorian Exploration Expedition from 1860 in Australia, where the folks went from Melbourne to what today is Corumba. Long story short, the podcaster noted at the beginning that this is not unlike the Lewis and Clark expedition if everyone on that expedition had been stupid. It's a fairly accurate description. Hmm, I like that description. I don't know anything about Melbourne or Corumba, but I generally approve of stupid people walking and I have engaged in that exact activity myself on more than one occasion. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the brothers through yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about the Burke and Wills expedition. Maybe we'll talk about Lewis and Clark. Maybe we'll talk about Lois and Clark. Maybe we'll talk about incompetence, Coulter's hell, or the 896 tallest peak in the state of Montana. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we explore our most recent texts, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus it's time for Ablusions and edification. Today we need to start things off with an ablution of mine going back to our last episode, which was all about the people in Winnipeg drinking a lot of Slurpees. Do you remember that episode? It was quite the tasty episode. It was indeed. Within that episode, I talked about 7-Eleven trademarking the term brain freeze. I remember that. And then I got to wondering, how can you trademark a colloquial term such as brain freeze? I don't think you can do that. So I did a little bit of research into it. And whereas I had probably implied that they were trademarking the phrase to the point in which if, say, Cheryl Druyer went out in public and said, oh, I have brain freeze, that the gendarmes would send her directly to, I don't know, the Chateau d'If or to some other prison. But brain freeze has not been trademarked in terms of its colloquial term. In the same manner that Burger King has the Whopper for a sandwich, but I can go out and say, man, that bag of candy is a Whopper. No, because Whoppers are candy too. You can actually eat Whoppers, yes. You can eat Whoppers as a candy. So yeah, you can't name your hamburger sandwich at a restaurant the Whopper. Right. You can't name your frozen soda drink a brain freeze. McDowell's. Yes, <laughs> McDowell's. That is what 7-Eleven was able to do is they trademark brain freeze specifically as a semi-frozen soft drink. Right. So you can go out and say, oh, I have brain freeze as much as you want. You don't have to go around telling people that you're experiencing sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia just to avoid being charged with trademark law. That's good. That is my ablution. Brad, I hear that you have some edification for us today. What are you going to teach myself and our multitude of listeners in at least 18 countries across the globe? Woo, 18, huh? Something like that. Well, I'm going to stay with language here, and you just got to bear with me for a second. Nope. Roughly 44 sounds in the English language. People quibble between 42 and 45, but generally accept it to be 44. Whether there are 42 or 44, the number doesn't matter as much. The upshot is that there are more than we have symbols, which we have 26 symbols or letters in the English language. Other languages, like Spanish, for instance, have a symbol for each sound. Oh. They have all the letters, plus accent marks, tildes to depict other sounds. There's a symbol or a letter. You know what you're pronouncing because it's clear. If English would do the same, we would most definitely have lower incidences of challenged readers. But you don't have to take my word for it that the English language is dumb. do 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 No other than inventor extraordinaire and founding father, Benjamin Franklin, also thought our alphabet to be lacking. Oh. He didn't go as far as addressing all 44 sounds, but he did remove some letters and replace them with new letters to represent common digraphs, you know, like the SH sound. Sure. 
I know you debated leaving this whole discussion out of episode 20, Swan Boats and the Real Bonapartes of New Jersey. Did I leave it out? You did not, Oh, uh, but you doubted my opinion on this. Yeah, I doubt extemporaneously produced stats. But if you doubt my opinion now, you are a Tory loyalist. So there. Like Ben Franklin's son. Like Ben Franklin's son. Well put. Bonus quiz. Bonus quiz. Are there more sounds in the English language or more STDs that Ben Franklin had? I have no clue. I'm guessing sounds in the English language, but it's probably closer than it should be. Different types of STDs or specific STDs? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. No. Let's move on. All righty, Brother Brad. Today was your show, your text, your expedition. What do you want to tell us about to get things kicked off? I was listening to a podcast about explorers, a series of podcasts about explorers called The Explorers Podcast. Oh, I didn't know that there were other podcasts besides ours. There are, apparently. The Explorers Podcast by Matt Breen, an excellent set of podcasts if one's into exploration history. And he started to explain a new collection of episodes on the Burke and Wills Expedition or the Victorian Exploring Expedition in Australia, which I have never heard of, of course, before I listened to this. Probably most Americans have not. It's known as a very heroic failure. Mm. And uh, as he was beginning to explain it, he said, Matt Breen says, I was talking to my college age son about it. And he said to me, it's like Lewis and Clark with stupidity. Oh, and I thought that was excellent. And I noted that to myself. I wonder if that's going to be true. And the more and more I listened to it, it became clear that that was kind of a very apt explanation of the expedition. Stupidity as in stupid people, stupid actions, stupid preparations, all the above? Yes, all the above. It, you know, uh, it's not stupid as in funny. It's, there's nothing really funny about the expedition. It, it's quite tragic in many different ways. They chose a person to run it who was not really qualified, mostly because he was good in club settings. He was a good guy and was a nice, solid Australian and would be a good representative. So they're making this journey from Melbourne. And note that we are saying Melbourne instead of Melbourne. (laughs) I'm sure we're getting plenty of other things wrong. But (laughs) But that one, I think we feel confident we're getting right. And Melbourne is on the south coast of Australia. So it was the first time anybody was going to try to journey from south to north, which is a distance of about 2,000 miles from the point where they left to the point where they were going, Mm. which is the Bay of Carpentaria. And they make this journey. They hire a bad person to lead it. There's dissension in the ranks because of disagreement about who should lead it. They basically started it in the driest of dry season, which everybody kind of knew they were doing, which was stupid. Oops. They completely ignored the native population of Australia. They could have learned some things from them. They could have had some guides. They could have done anything with the native population instead of just ignoring them. They failed to do that. This is a historical story that repeats itself all over. Over and over. These are the great European explorers exploring a continent that the interior was already known by the aboriginal (laughs) Australians, which will sound familiar to to certainly anybody studying North American history or any, yeah. the history of so many places. Yeah. In the end, they don't even make it all the way to the north. They fall about five kilometers short <laughs> of the Bay of Carpentaria because they couldn't get through the swamps and the mangroves and they were just too tired and sick to make it any further. And they knew they were never going to make it back if they tried <laughs> to go further. So they just said, close enough, we can smell the salt and oh. uh, turn around. They had a supply depot built for them at a place called Cooper's Creek. They had asked the group that was there, their relief squad, to wait for them for three months. But the smarter of the explorers on this group of four that made the long journey said, can you actually wait four months? They missed the relief party by nine hours. Nine hours. They left a sign up and said, dig here. They dug there and they found a book that said, you just missed us, basically. And some supplies. What would you do if you found a bunch of supplies? You dug them up. What would you do with that box? If I went anywhere, I would leave a note to let other people know. And and where would you leave this note? I would hang it on the big tree. Would you put it in the box, bury it back underground, make it look like nobody dug anything up, and leave everything like nobody was there? Well, if I was a conspiracy theorist of the modern era, maybe. (laughs) Well, that's what Burke and Wills did. They dug up the box, smart, reburied it with their notes, and then took a different path than the one they originally took to try to find a way back because they didn't think they could make it on the other path. 
If they had left the box unburied, the leader of the Reef Party felt bad, decided to come back one more time and check. He saw nothing disturbed, so he went back the way he came and didn't know they had been there. Like, it was just comedy of error after comedy of error in a very dark, sad, tragic comedy. Because then, pretty much, they all died, right? They all died except for this John King guy, but he was brutally attacked in the media after that and never really talked about it because everybody thought basically he killed everybody so he could survive and he didn't do enough and why did he live? And he only lived because of some of the native population, the Aborigines, did collect him and keep him alive for a good amount of time he lived with them Hmm. before he could finally make his way back to civilization. But it was tragic and it was terrible. One of the things I saw is their supplies that they brought with them were ridiculous. Yes. And I didn't delve into it any more than like they brought a Chinese gong with them. <laughs> they and brought all kinds of stupid stuff with them. They was terrible. 15,000 people sent them off from Melbourne, but that first day they made it 11 kilometers, so I know, six or seven miles or something like yeah. that. And they just moved at that incredibly slow pace. And... So slow. And all the experienced folks left when they got to their first real stop because it took them so long. They're like, there is no way we're going to make it. We're all going to die. So they just all left. And so they had the less than competent, generally speaking, people left. Now, there were some soldiers and people who were dedicated to their duty and had some experience exploring, and they stayed. But generally speaking, the ones who didn't feel like they had to just left because they didn't think they were going to live. And it was a good call because it was a terrible thing. But like you said, this is not an uncommon story. So for every Roald Admanson in Antarctica, there was a Robert Falcon Scott who was a British man who refused to use sled dogs the way they should be used, wouldn't ski Mm. because he didn't think that was British enough, tried to take a car across Antarctica. And Amundsen beat him to the pole. Scott dies on the way back and everybody's mad at Amundsen like he did something wrong. Yeah. It was Scott who had a terrible plan and was heartbroken when he found out he made it to the South Pole, but was second and uh, really never mentally recovered on the trip back. But if he had learned how to use sled dogs like Amundsen did, learned how to ski like Amundsen did, he probably would have made it too. It's just for every uh, lucky listener who gets to go on these journeys with us, with our huge knowledge of of our (laughs) topics and explorations that we have. You know, there's a bumbling Phileas Fogg who only gets through his journey because of Passepartout. For Americans, I think the most comparable expedition in terms of what was being attempted, not what was being achieved, is the Lewis and Clark expedition. Lewis and Clark ended up going at least twice the distance. Yeah, and we learn about their core of discovery, that expedition to explore for anybody who's not as familiar with American history, since we are in 18 countries across the globe. 18 countries! We purchased this giant section of what becomes the central continental United States these days called the Louisiana Purchase. We get it from France and the following year, an expedition goes out that is very famous. This expedition, very different from Burke and Wills and their Victorian exploration expedition in Australia because These guys were former soldiers. They recruited other former soldiers. They recruited people who had wilderness skills, trappers, interpreters, people who had communicated with the Native Americans. So it's easy to see why Burke and Wills failed. One thing I thought that was interesting about Burke and Wills, though, their ineptitude might have actually enabled their mission to in terms of ultimate results, be a little bit more successful because they were able to provide a more complete picture of inland Australia. Yep, yep. And one of the things they were able to disprove was that there was this great inland sea, which of course the Aboriginal Australians knew that there was not this great inland (laughs) sea. Somebody could have asked them, but there wasn't this great inland sea. But they were able to establish even more of a map because of their failure. There were numerous search parties who came in from various directions and were able to explore more of the land. Yeah, and they do call it a heroic failure. I mean, what they accomplished was nothing short of amazing with their lack of skills, lack of preparation, their lack of knowledge of where they were going. The fact that they accomplished what they accomplished and almost survived to tell the tale is amazing in and of itself. Yeah, just didn't end well. No, it it really didn't. This all got me thinking about this whole discovery doctrine that exists, which is basically a theory in international law that allowed European Christians to claim land rights anywhere they went where there wasn't already an existing European Christian land right. Basically, just the legalized theft that occurred when these types of expeditions took place. Yeah. And very familiar theme throughout history. I saw a, not the most prestigious source, but I saw a video from the uh, college humor folks 
oh. that's labeled this Columbusing. We know. Did you say Columbusing? Columbusing. So we know yeah. Christopher Columbus. and He made four journeys and still thought he had found India. And treated people horrifically along the way. Yes. Columbus didn't discover things. Columbus discovered things for white people. Yes. And the college humor basically created this term, Columbusing. The discovery doctrine is basically the Columbusing of places. It's people of European origin claiming all these things that aren't their own. And it's right. tied into imperialism and colonialism and those foundational myths, you know, if Columbus wasn't the first person to discover America, it had to be the Vikings, these other white people, when for tens of thousands of years, there were already people here. <laughs> Not there were. And Burke and Wills and Columbus aren't alone in their bumbling. No. Mungo Park and Dr. Livingston in Africa, you know, they're famous for having died on their journeys. Uh, the guy who looked for the lost city of Z in South America. Ernest Shackleton is known for surviving his own failure and incompetence of his journey. Now, he was really good in a crisis and had stamina for days and days, but he basically survived failure, and that's why he's known. I mean, that open boat journey on the James Caird to South Georgia Island was incredible. His walking across South Georgia Island and no one it had ever done before and coming out of the wilderness like some mountain trolls, you know, and scaring the people on the island. It's just ooh, incredible. Ponce de Leon looking for the Fountain of Youth, a terrible journey, mm -hmm. but resulted in Florida. Ferdinand Magellan going around the world, and he didn't really even make it all the way because he stopped to try to make himself king of some island. But Enrique <laughs> of Malacca, his slave, actually is the first person to go around the world because he was picked up mm -hmm. in that part of the Pacific, carried around the world, and escaped into obscurity. The history is full of stories of explorers who were good at exploring, explorers who were really just greedy murderers, explorers who were more lucky than good, and they're also just people who were bad at exploring and shouldn't have done it. <laughs> I have a person that I had never heard of. I started down this path of what other ridiculously failed expeditions might yeah. there be that I hadn't heard of. Most of the ones you just named are ones that I don't know every detail of, but I had familiarity with. So I was thinking, what's out there that I don't know anything about? Right. And I found one that I really did enjoy. Have you ever heard of a French man that was born in the 1880s called Charles Bidot? Bidet? Bidot. Bidot. <laughs> I have not, to my knowledge, heard of Charles Bedeau. So let me quickly try and tell you the story of Charles Bedeau, because he is my explorer I'd never heard of that I think is the most ridiculous. It all begins with Charles Bedeau being born in the mid-1880s. His father is a railway engineer. His mom is a seamstress. They want him to go to school. He drops out something like a year and a half before he graduates. He goes to the notorious red light district in Paris, and he begins using his skills, which he is extremely personable. He becomes basically a hawker trying to lure people into the cabarets. His mentor is a pimp named Henri Ledoux. But surprise, this mentor of his Henri is shot and killed, and Bedeau just heads for New York City. He's five and a half feet tall, as charismatic as he can be. He arrives with basically nothing, takes low paying jobs, but he becomes extremely famous and extremely influential because he essentially develops this brand new theory on increasing worker efficiency. And all of these tycoons who are around in the late 1800s, they see his consultancy as being very valuable to make their businesses successful. And of course, they have the money to pay somebody that is able to do that. He becomes friends with people like Babe Ruth, Ernest Hemingway, and he comes across a lot of money. He also becomes friends with this guy named André Citroën. Have you heard of Citroën? I assume you're talking about the car company. Yes. And in this case, the maker of a car that was described in this article I read in the Globe and Mail in 2018 by a writer named Brendan McAleer, he described this vehicle as a cross of a Model T and a tank. Oh. Yes. It's basically to give you the front end steering of a car with, I guess, the all-terrain qualities of a tank. An early day Hummer. <laughs> Something like that. Tell him about it, Jojo. And so our kid, Charles Bedeau, this guy who was trained by pimps and rose up through the new money here in the United States, he's a bit of an, well, he is a, an experienced woodsman. He had gone up to Canada and done some exploring on his own. But with his connections with Citroën, he decides that he wants to go up there with some of their vehicles, and he wants to go on this expedition that became known as the Bedeau Subarctic Expedition. 
The intent was to cross 2,400 kilometers from Edmonton through uncharted areas of the Rockies, ending up in Telegraph Creek, British Columbia. But here's where things get a little crazy. I'm just going to read directly from the article now. The Bedeau Subarctic Expedition, which comprised a French millionaire, his wife, his mistress, who was an Italian countess who brought her own maid, two geographers, a film crew, a Hollywood cinematographer, around 50 Albertan cowboys, five half-track vehicles, which are those vehicles I described, half-track, half-wheeled, 150 pack horses carrying gasoline, clotted cream, caviar, champagne, formal wear for attending balls, and one of the horses was just to carry ladies' boots. What about the professor and Marianne? (laughs) Yes. Did you know that in the original season of Gilligan's Island, when they listed off all the characters, they say Gilligan and then the skipper too, and millionaire and his wife. But when they get to the end, they didn't originally say professor and Marianne. They say, and the rest. (laughs) For the last two. (laughs) Yes. And later (laughs) on, they were added. But yes, so this is the expedition. Brad, let me ask you, do you think that the subarctic expedition was successful in crossing the 2,400 kilometers uh, with this entourage that I just described? I'm going to assume since we're talking about failed explorers or people who are bad at it, that no, they didn't make it. Yeah, so they, they didn't make it all the way. Less than 24 hours after they started, the first of these Citroen half-tracks was lodged in the muddy bottom of a creek. Soon they decided that they needed to lighten the load of the things that they were carrying. So, you know, obviously they had all the gasoline and the cream caviar champagne. So they did what anybody would do, which is they got rid of all their scientific equipment. (laughs) As they realized they weren't going to make it all the way and that these vehicles weren't going to make it all the way, Badeau actually decided to have some of these filmmakers that were along do things like driving these Citroens off cliffs and exploding them to just make a good show. And surprise, surprise, they didn't succeed in their journey, but they only gave up 300 kilometers out of 2,400. They only gave up 300 kilometers short of their goal as snow began to fall in October. The mission cost Bedeau a staggering $250,000 in 1934 dollars, but he didn't seem that bothered, and his expedition was celebrated massive banquets when he got home, remember who his friends were, right. so not much of a surprise. This is all taking place in the 1930s, mid-1930s. So, of course, what's going on in the world at that time, there are some crazy things going on. Just as an aside, hazard a guess, Brother Brad. Were the years following this adventure kind to Charles Bedeau? I'm going to have to assume no as well, as they weren't kind to many people. Yeah, and uh, I don't think you'll be too surprised to hear that a rich guy who runs in a big crowd and is interested in attaching himself to the rising crowd in the 1930s starts to cozy up to rising fascist powers in Germany, becomes friends with Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson after the king had abdicated the throne. In fact, there's an account that he arranged for the couple to meet one Adolf Hitler on their honeymoon. By 1944, while under investigation for treason by the FBI, Bedeau is in a hotel room in Miami, and that is where he committed suicide. (sighs) Ultimately, his footage, which had been shot by a well-known cinematographer named Floyd Crosby on this journey, that footage was recovered in the mid-1980s, turned into a documentary called The Champagne Safari in 1995, Mm. which is also the name of a poorly made honeymoon video for Rita Hayworth. But the Champagne Safari, I think, is a wonderful name for this failed mission called the Bedeau Subarctic Expedition. I was looking for other failed expeditions, and I didn't really come up with one quite as exciting and expansive as that one. But it's something that I actually first ran across when I was researching for our Johnny Appleseed show, because it also involves a weird new religion. Mm. Have you heard of August Engelhardt? I have not. August Engelhardt was a young German man in the late 1800s, and he became what is known as a cocovore. Do you know what a cocovore is? A person who loved the phenomenon of cocoa? No, not bad guess, but it's someone who eats exclusively coconuts and drinks coconut liquid. Oh. Uh, so a cocovore or cocovorian. Would he have put the lime into the coconut? In fact, he would not have put the lime in the coconut because he believed other tropical fruit made him sick. He only (laughs) 
<laughs> only partook of coconuts. That is the best answer to a stupid question I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I actually anticipated that. <laughs> there was a whole thing in Germany in the late 1880s where they were starting to eat just fruit and vegetables and being healthy and returning to nature. So he takes his inheritance, which was rather substantial, after he finishes school for like he was like a scientist and he goes Science. and he goes and buys two thirds of an island in Papua New Guinea, which was part of Germany at the time, an island called Kobukan, a coconut and banana plantation. But he stopped growing bananas, only grew coconuts. But then he started to go even crazier. So he's got this coconut only diet. He starts to think about the sun growing the coconuts. The coconuts are the most important because they're the closest to the sun. The brain is at the top of the head and the head is fed by the roots of the hair, which is closest to the sun. The coconut looks like your head. The head looks like a coconut. Yeah, it's all coming together. Right. So he starts worshiping the sun, basically, and he's naked all the time. Mm. And he gets all these other people to come hang out on his plantation with him and be part of his uh, cult, sun god cult, right? <laughs> So he actually does fairly well eating only coconuts. So early on, all his people start dying and leaving. And the native inhabitants of the island complained to the local authorities that there's a raving lunatic. He's scaring our children. He's out in the forest yelling at trees. And we really need you to come take care of it. So they take him to hospital. He's covered completely in ulcers. He's just about dead. They think he's going to die. He pulls through. He escapes from the hospital and goes back. For many more years, he goes back to this mm. plantation until basically after 18 years, he becomes a crazy skeleton man yelling at trees and the authorities <laughs> come to help him again. This time he dies. He was five foot five. So about the same height as your fellow. Yeah. Weighed 69 pounds oh when they gosh. finally found him. But he made a living off the coconuts and the coconut oil and all that stuff. Hmm. Ultimately, this little adventure and exploration in both religion and diet ended in failure and horrendous illnesses for everybody involved. Some unsolved mysteries. There's some films built around the unsolved mysteries of people dying. Robert Stack? Uh, I don't believe it was Robert Stack, no. Oh, man. Robert Stack just needs to introduce... All unsolved mysteries? All everything. He should, he should introduce our show in the future. Oh, Robert Stack? <laughs> if, <laughs> if you're listening... If you're... If you're one of our dozens of listeners, I don't know what we can pay you, but uh, we got a job for you. Let us know. I can buy you Skittles, man. Brad, we started this whole conversation out by talking about the Burke and Wills expedition. We talked briefly about Lewis and Clark. Yes, we did. Are you familiar with the person who was on the Lewis and Clark expedition who went by the name York? I am generally knowledgeable about York, yes. I was not. So... I think it's just a really cool opportunity to talk about somebody that the Brad Dreers of the world know something about, but the Jeff Dreers don't, and I presume a lot of people don't know about. This man known as York was born into enslavement. His parents, his father was known as Old York, and his mother, Rose, they were owned by William Clark's father, John. York would have been a similar age to William Clark, but he was certainly in bonded servitude and later on became essentially his body servant is what he would have been called. When Meriwether Lewis invited Clark, essentially his army buddy, to join him on this long voyage to explore these newly acquired lands, they thought very carefully about who they brought with them. And they brought those interpreters and those trappers and people who knew the wilderness and people who had all these skills. And one of the shoe-ins to be brought along was York. As a result of this, it's believed that he ends up being the first African-American to cross the continent and see the Pacific Ocean. Some people credit York as being the first African-American whose vote counted alongside that of white Americans when they had to decide where to make a winter camp. Now, I don't mean to suggest that everything York did was treated equally. Just a month into the trip, the journals have it that in a disagreement, one of the other men threw sand into York's eye, and they thought he might lose the eye. But during the journey, he was handling firearms, which an enslaved person would not have been allowed to do back home in Louisville. He led some of their scouting expeditions. He was often involved when they were meeting Native Americans and coming up with various agreements with them. He was essential during this trip. And at great personal sacrifice, he was sick. He was injured numerous times. He had frostbite. This is a person who put a lot into this journey. When the trip ends, this mission, by the way, for those who don't know Lewis and Clark, they make it out to the Pacific coast from St. Louis. They come back 1804, 1805, 1806. It gets back. It's very successful in its original intent of exploring this territory, creating relationships with the Native Americans already in those places, 
studying plants and animals and geography, and York was essential in all this. And when they got home, the people who took part in this expedition were granted fame and land grants and financial awards. Brad, was York granted any of that? I don't believe so. No, he was not. And he didn't think that that was probably even a chance. What he hoped for is that William Clark would issue him his freedom, which Clark actually refused to do. Clark moved from Louisville out to St. Louis, but York had a wife back in Louisville. So he wanted to be able to, at the very least, be sold to somebody so he could stay in Louisville. Clark refused that. And even though for many years, and I'm talking into the 1980s, historians maintained that York did receive his freedom from Clark at the end of the expedition and talked about their great friendship. We then uncovered some of the letters that Clark had written to his brother, which reveals the heinous treatment that York had received. And a lot of it was, well, just listen to how he talked about York in these letters. This would be William Clark writing to his brother. I will permit him to stay a few weeks with his wife. He is serviceable to me at this place, and I am determined not to gratify him and have directed him to return. If any attempt is made by York to run off or refuse to perform his duty as a slave, I wish him sent to New Orleans and sold and hired out to some severe slave master until he thinks of such conduct. When York comes to St. Louis, Clark actually, he says that he trounced him one day to teach him a lesson. Clark later tells Washington Irving that this guy who was so vital by all accounts on the Lewis and Clark expedition was now being lazy. He couldn't tend his horses. He wasn't making an effort. And he was begging to come back to slavery when he ultimately was freed at some point, which is basically just stuff that the white man says to promote the industry of slavery. I read one time about him that he kept him in St. Louis for a long time and York wanted to go back and see his wife. But by the time he finally got back, his wife had been moved to Mississippi. Yep, she went to Natchez. So he did end up back in Louisville with an owner that was known to be particularly harsh in his treatment. At some point, York did gain his freedom. We're not sure exactly how. Yeah. There is a dispute as to how it ended from then. Clark actually claimed that he took to cholera and died in Tennessee. There are other accounts saying that there was an African-American living with the Native American Crow in Wyoming who uh, claimed he had traveled with Lewis and Clark, living very well amongst the Native Americans out west in the 1830s. So many accounts believe that that might have actually been York. It's not lost on you or I that we are two more white guys talking about history. Yeah. So I thought it was very cool to be able to look at an expedition of two white men that I knew and to learn about another side of it. Well, and the reason that I know about him is uh, when Clinton was president, he honored York as a, I want to say a sergeant. Yeah, he did grant him a, a posthumous, yeah. Uh, right, yeah, a sergeant in the expedition. So he made him a full-fledged member of the expedition. Yeah. Shifting gears from York, though. We do have a personal connection to the Lewis and Clark expedition. Is it to St. Chabonneau? <laughs> All of our listeners who aren't our family members might be wondering why the graphics for our podcast say Brad and Jeff Drewyard, D-R-E-W-Y-O-R, but we at various points mention Drewyard, and we might have mentioned this in the podcast at some point, but we do have a quarter of our family that comes from this French-Canadian history, the Drouillards, D-R-O-U-I-L-L-A-R-D. And there is a famous family member who took part in the Lewis and Clark expedition. His name was George Drouillard. It would be safe to say that George Drouillard was often serving as the right-hand man of Meriwether Lewis. Brother Brad, are you aware of exactly what our ancestral relationship is? We know that we're not descended from his line, but what is our connection to George Drouillard? I don't know. No. I now do. In researching oh. this, I found out that our fourth great-grandfather, Louis, was first cousins with George Drouillard. So George Drouillard's mm. father, Pierre would have been the brother of our fifth great-grandfather, Simon Amable Drouillard, and our lines would have connected with Simon and Pierre's father, our sixth great-grandfather, Jean-Baptiste Drouillard. Yeah. But yeah, Georges Drouillard, the most famous of the Drouillards here in North America, his father was a French-Canadian named Pierre. His mother was a Shawnee. Because he had this Native American background, he knew French, he knew English, he could speak Shawnee, and he also knew this kind of sign language that was used by many Native American tribes to communicate with each other. 
He was hired as a civilian interpreter, but he was a renowned pathfinder, a scout, a hunter, map maker. He was one of the highest paid members of the expedition when it ended. And Meriwether Lewis said that he was able to communicate because of Dreer, D-R-E-W-Y-E-R, and that his skills were essential throughout this expedition. One thing that I really thought was cool that I didn't know was that after the Lewis and Clark expedition, it's 1806, 1807, he finds out that this farmer's life isn't for him. He joins a Spaniard named Manuel Lisa, who was leading another expedition way up to the northern end of the Missouri River. As a part of that expedition, George Triard would make these long journeys, 300 miles, 200 miles, as did many of the other people on the expedition, which included some other veterans of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Coming back from one of these missions, he describes seeing these amazing thermal phenomena. One of the other Lewis and Clark expedition members, who was also on this Manuel Lisa expedition, was a guy named John Coulter. And I knew about John Coulter because on one of his journeys, just like the one we just described for George, he came back and he saw those same geothermal phenomena. He described him. And as those notes got back to the East, people said that John Coulter was just making up complete fantasy. They called it Coulter's hell. He was describing things that we would now know as fumaroles, geysers, hot springs, mud pots. John Coulter was not making any of it up. He had discovered what we now know as the geothermal features of Yellowstone National Park. What I had never known before is that George Druyard had also experienced those things with his own eyes at the same time that John Coulter would have been discovering them. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for George Druyard, he can't give up this uh, wilderness life, this trapping life. In 1810, he's out on a beaver trapping trip in the upper Missouri River. They had encountered some Native Americans who were hostile toward the party in that area. And some of his fellow expedition folks left the expedition because it was so dangerous. Remember, Druyard, George, he's half Native American. He bragged one of his companions that he was too much of an Indian to be caught by Indians. Later on, when his horse and his remains were found decapitated and disemboweled, it proved that that background that he had could not save him. That's how George Druyard met his end. Yeah. One last little bit on that, though. Brad, do you happen to know what the 896th tallest peak in Montana is? Or, to give you another clue, the 11,825th tallest mountain peak in these United States of America? I don't. I do know who the 142nd fastest gun in the West was. That was Irving. Irving. No, I do not know. Believe it or not, that 896th tallest peak in Montana is called Mount Druyard. Is it spelled correctly? I saw it listed as formerly Mount Druyer, D-R-E-W-Y-E-R, which is one letter off from our spelling. Right. But it is now labeled as Mount Druyard, D-R-O-U-I-L-L-A-R-D, 8,179 feet, 2,493 meters, sitting in an area known as the Bob Marshall Wilderness in what would be western Montana, It doesn't seem to be a peak that people are venturing off to a whole lot or anything like that, because in its capacity as a government-protected wilderness area, there are no roads, there's no logging, there's no mining or anything in this area, which means it's particularly difficult to get to Mount Druyard. There aren't a ton of photos out there or anything like that, but it also means that it's likely that our mountain shall endure. Do we have ancestral rights to hunt on that mountain or anything? We don't got nothing. I also don't hunt, so it would be useless to me if we did. It works out. Maybe we could go sledding there. Yes. Well, Brother Brad, since we've been discussing all things Druyard, we're descended from Louis Druyard and Louis Druyard and Louis Druyard and all those other people that I mentioned. But another fella descended from them is our father, Arthur. And we're going to ask him some questions. Canadian-born George Druyard was an essential member of the early 19th century Lewis and Clark expedition and is descended from the same early French-Canadian Druyards as yourself. In addition to his skills as an interpreter, he was known for being a talented hunter, trapper, scout, and woodsman. How would you rate your proficiency on all of these skills? Probably minus 10. 
You were a Spanish major for a little while, right? Yeah, the linguistics part would be the only thing I had any proficiency with. You don't find yourself to be a great hunter or woodsman? Uh, no. Uh. If you could form a party of individuals from your life, past or present, to accompany you on a mission of exploration across some uncharted land, who would you choose if survival and the attainment of knowledge were both your priorities? Probably my my three brothers and my father because they had a wide array of, of skills and experiences that would have assisted me. And also, I would have included my sister in case I needed to know how to dance. Obviously, Glenda would have helped. Yes. Because she had outdoor skills and medical skills. You have many people you could have chosen to go on this adventure. I do. I am not one of those people. <laughs> well... <laughs> And Jeff, maybe, because he has a lot of crazy ideas. But and he has travel skills. And if, I yeah. need, if I needed to pack... <laughs> he could help you pack. Yeah, he could help me pack. If I were to ask you what a cocovore was, what would you tell me? I don't know, but it sounds tasty. It, it could be. A cocovore is a person who eats exclusively coconuts and drinks the, the water from coconut. Ooh, I, I do like coconut, so maybe I'm a cocovore. So you could have lived with August Engelhardt, a German man who created a religion of the sun on a small island near Papua New Guinea, and he lived only on coconuts. Unsurprisingly, it did not go well. <laughs> Although he lived quite some time, many of his followers died. That is interesting. I'll, I'll look forward to that. If you were to create a cult, and you would base it on a single food, what is that cult and why? Possibly uh, candy corn. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think... No! <laughs> yes, no. I, I candy corn and Necco wafers, because obviously they are, they are God's natural foods. <laughs> no! You, you, can't, you can't juice those. You would have no liquid in your diet. Well, I could, I could squeeze them. <laughs> I could squeeze them really hard. <laughs> I don't think this is going to end well for you. But it didn't end well for August Engelhardt either. No, Necco wafers are kind of dry. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about the Discovery Doctor, Christopher Columbus, Phileas Fogg, the relatively unknown but incredibly talented American explorer named York, George Druyard, Charles Bedeau's Champagne Safari, and August Engelhart, the Cocovore. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there will be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked or what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. Eric Neve does it all the time. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, and if you manage to go and join our Things I Text My Brother team on the American Red Cross blood donation app, the fraternity of Driard will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. The following is a text... Oh, I had I had a cursor over the E of the word exchange, and so I couldn't read it, even though I've said that phrase. Uh, not just 24 like episodes, but like twice each time we record it. And it's also the easiest line I have to say. Brad, did you just die? Yes. Huh. How did Hang that on. happen? I stood up because there's someone walking through my yard with a flashlight. And I went to check, and I tripped over my cord. Do you need to go attack them? No, I just need to see what they're doing. Go get them. I think it's the neighbor, but I'm going to look here. Mm. You should turn your, your camera so I can see him. That's uh, just the neighbor. He must have but some why leak. is he in your yard with a flashlight? Uh, he must be having leaks from the rain. So he's in your he yard was. with a flashlight. Yeah, I think he was just walking back so he could see his roof. Oh. Because we had to walk back into our yard, but he's out over in his yard now, so. Huh. Sorry about that. It wasn't supposed to be such a, a traumatic thing that I got caught in my cords. He was going exploring. He was. <laughs>